Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and you're watching The Brown Feminist. So in today's video, just as promised, I'm here to tell you guys exactly what kind of questions I was asked when I was interviewing for my role as a clinical trial coordinator slash a clinical research assistant level three. So I've done quite a few interviews over the past six months and they were for different kinds of organizations from hospital research institutes to CROs. And in all these cases, I applied for jobs which had a little bit more pay and a little bit more responsibility than what I had done the last couple of years. And for most of them, the interviews had very similar questions, lots of overlapping questions and a certain type of question. And my answers were also pretty similar. They were based on my own experiences and qualifications. So today I want to tell you guys exactly what questions were asked, how I handle them, and give you guys some general tips of how you can use the questions as an opportunity to kind of impress them and tell them a lot more about yourself. So um, because I did get quite a few of these um, interviews, they turned into job offers, I think this video might be really beneficial because I guess I've sort of uh, learned how to do interviews for these positions. And without further ado, let's get into it. So the very first question that I got asked was the most common of them all, and you must have also had questions like these asked to you, and that is, hi, how are you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we begin? Now, this might sound like a very generic, casual question, and you might be like, huh, like what part about myself do they want to know, like who I am as a person? No. What they really want to ask you through this question is tell us your story. Tell us who you are, what your career goals are, what brings you here, what you've done so far. Just tell us your unique story so we can kind of better visualize you as a person, but primarily in your professional life and figure out how you fit in into our organization, our project and how this role makes sense for your career. How are these two stories aligned? Now, this question is really important because this is a great opportunity for you to tell them your story and also to help them make sense of a lot of things that might be missing on your resume. Now, a lot of the times our resume has components that might be raising a few eyebrows or creating some curiosity. For example, there might be a gap in your employment history. There might be some misalignment between your degrees versus what you're working in. Um, there might be like a lot of things. You might be making a jump within the specialty of clinical research or the type you're doing, or you're leaving one kind of organization and like going into academia, or you're leaving academia and going into CROs. So it would be helpful for you to use this opportunity um, to kind of build a picture of who you are and what brings you there. So in my case, this was my answer. And this was mainly because my past experiences were not in clinical research. And I know a lot of people will be confused, huh? She has a bachelor's in this and a master's in that, but she's here for a clinical research role. So like, what's up? What's the story? So this is exactly how I handle this question. So as you already know, my name is Rihanna and I'm applying for this clinical research role. So a little bit about myself and my background is that my journey is a little bit unconventional coming into clinical research. I actually did my undergraduate degree and my graduate training in like basic sciences. I worked in these hospitals and did my master's in this university, um, primarily within a laboratory environment and did publications. But after working in that field for a few years, I felt that this wasn't my true calling. Um, instead of working within a wet lab environment, I would much rather work with people and patients and have my focus be a lot more on translational research, which has greater clinical impact. And so that's what made me like question if that was the right career track for me. So I did try to transition on directly from basic sciences to clinical research, but I found it a little bit challenging. And that's when I decided to do some schooling and training to kind of redirect me back into the path so I could build a career in this field. And that actually brought me to nursing school and I did my nursing training and had all of this clinical experience now, which could complement my previous like research knowledge and experience of research design and methodology. And then I was kind of set to start. Now I did work in a couple of different kind of varieties of research projects. And because the last few years, my goal was mainly to 
go around collecting lots of diverse experiences. I've worked on COVID projects, I've worked with government, I've worked in academia and a hospital. Um, but now that I've had like experience doing lots of different things in clinical research, I think it's time that I start uh, specializing and kind of finding my niche and what I want to work in. And the work, the role that you're advertising is actually really interesting to me. And I think that could be my long-term thing. I also feel like with all the, you know, diverse experiences I have, it's time to take on a little bit more responsibility. I've done all of these like grant writing and REB applications, dealt with patients. I have all of this stuff under my belt. I have my nursing ex experiences as well as my basic science experiences. So I'm really ready to take on some more responsibility and show what I can deliver. So that's basically my story. And that was basically it. That's what I said to this answer. And I said this in more than one interview. And it seemed to work out because after that, I saw quite a few nods and I could feel like, okay, now they were starting to make sense of my story. They were now less confused about what was on my resume and my cover letter. They kind of get, okay, this person's not just bouncing here today and there tomorrow, but they actually had a set of experiences. They decided to change their degree but they're still like took on the learning from that primary education and they kind of added on some new training and now they really know where they wanna go. And this is their opportunity to kind of go up the ladder. Now, the second question I got asked a lot was what interests you about this role and why our project, why our organization, why this kind of role? So there's a couple of different ways to answer it. Now, first of all, if you're actually applying from a completely different city or country, it's normal for them to also wonder like why this and why not somewhere else in the same country or the same province. So I usually like to clarify and say, well, either I'm from here or say, well, I'm moving here. And so I've been starting to look for things in the area. So it makes a little bit more sense to them. Okay, this person's not just randomly applying to a bunch of places online and they're not gonna ditch us when they realize how expensive it is to move, but rather they have thought it through and they have a long-term plan. In the other area, you should also kind of clarify that, okay, you see yourself working more in a hospital research environment. In my case, if you already know, I, I was working in academia for quite a bit of time. And this was the first job that I did, which is more like getting into a hospital research environment. Um, so moving from there to here, they were like, why are you doing this? Why are you leaving your job? So I gave them a very honest answer. I said, listen, I really love my role. I really love the PI that I was working under, but the kind of grant they work on, they have a lot of gaps between contracts. They don't really have like a lot of pharma sponsored projects. They don't have a lot of interventional drug trial projects because academic settings are not usually equipped to handle them. They do a lot more of like qualitative of observational cohort studies, but I'm really kind of looking for like the juicy stuff. <laughs> I'm looking for things that are more interventional, more translational, drug trials and patients working with pharmaceuticals on regulated trials and phase two and phase three trials and kind of seeing patients like change their conditions right in front of me. So that's really the experience that I'm looking for in the specialty of clinical research that I want to work in. So I thought it was time to kind of leave academia, both because it didn't have this kind of structure of projects and also because in terms of funding, academia often has like lots of gaps between contracts. Some years, some PIs don't even apply for grants and there's like no need for staff. So there is a little bit of, a, you know, job insecurity. But I know that in terms of the hospital structures and especially PIs who work with a lot of different pharmaceuticals and pharma sponsored studies and CROs, I know that that won't be an issue. And I can really focus on like working and learning the system of how to work with regulators like your public health agencies and your Health Canada and your federal organizations and your research ethics boards. So I really want to get into the crust of interventional drug trials. And that is something that really interests me in this role. So there you go. That's the kind of answer that I gave, not necessarily the answer answer for you, but in general, try to give them a little bit of a breakdown of why you're choosing this city, this kind of institute, this particular organization, or this kind of role. They just want to understand that a little bit better so they can know like how serious you are about the role, how much research you've done about the role, and also how much general like industry experience you have to be able to formulate this answer. Like clearly my answer, as you heard, was able to demonstrate that I know how clinical research works in academia and how clinical research works within um, hospital or CRO settings. 
So it does show that I'm able to really vocalize and verbalize my concerns and my future career strategy very well. And it's clearly aligned with the kind of organization they are. Now, the third question that I gave, and a lot of the times one number one, two, and three can have overlapping answers, so I completely get that. Um, but the third question I usually get is basically, tell us about your experiences and qualifications that have prepared you for this role. So for this kind of question, the answer they're really looking for is when they posted the job ad, there was a list of requirements, qualification requirements and experience requirements. They want to hear you say things that'll hit a lot of those ones. So they wanna be able to listen to your answer and tick off, has done this, has done that, contains this, like I experienced with that, qualified for this. So essentially you should structure your answer and break it down into a couple of key areas. I would start with like degree qualifications. Secondly, I would do work experiences. And thirdly, I would kind of garnish it with anything additional that you have. For example, like a nursing licensure or a CRP from SOPRA and other kind of licensures and um, like additional publications or grant experiences. So this is the kind of answer that I give. So I've actually done quite a few things just to lift, list them kind of off, to, off the top of my head. Um, I do have my bachelor's and master's and my nursing training under the belt. I am able to do this, this and this in patient care. I also have a lot of research experience. As you know, my resume indicates I have four years of experience and I think uh, primarily what matches a lot with the role you've advertised for. I've done multi-site clinical trials. I have done research ethics board applications and one of the most recent roles I've worked in, they actually were affiliated with your hospital from the academic institute I worked in, which which means that I've actually worked with the same research ethics board that you also fall under. Um, so I have used their kind of digital platform and I've done communication with them um, and things like that. Um, and apart from that, of course, moving more into like the additional stuff I've done other than like the typical role of a research coordinator. I have manuscript writing experience, grant writing experience. I've won a couple of grant writing um, kind of contests. Um, and I've won like about $30,000 in like this national grant um, for my last PI, as, as you can see on my resume. And it was about like a national call for a pilot study within hepatitis C networks. Um, apart from that, as you can see, I have some first authored papers and for that I did all of the manuscript writing and data analysis by myself. I have some experience in data management in the healthcare area. I've done patient chart audits and other things. I'm actually also qualified to be taking the clinical research professional title exam um, and I'm just signed up for this in the next couple of months. So there you have it. I gave a little bit of a summary of kind of the degrees I've done, licensures I have, work experience I've done, and then touched on some of the things that are similar in my experience to the role I've applied for. So drawing this last bit of connection is very important. You don't just like list one, two, three, four, five things I've done. You also have to remind them, hey, out of these seven or eight things I've done, these five are actually common to you. I actually know which kind of patient management software you use. I actually know what kind of um, research ethic boards you apply to and how they function because I've worked with them. Or I've, I kind of have a knowledge of maybe the department or the study of the physiology or the kind of patient assessments you do. Okay, so the next question I've also been asked in a couple of the different job roles and that is, the interviewer will ask you something like, okay, tell us about an incident where you've had to handle conflict or tell us about an incident where you've had a problem at work and you had to troubleshoot it and how did you manage it? So for these kind of questions, it's important for me to get some clarification on what kind of problems they're talking about, whether it's conflict resolution among colleagues or whether it's like an ethical conundrum within a study or something with patient care. So oftentimes I will just go out and say, just for clarity, do you want an example that's more from clinical patient experience or something within like management and staffing issues? And a lot of the times the answer they gave me was whichever. We just wanna want you to come up with any of the, draw from any of these examples. It doesn't matter. We just wanna hear your problem solving ability. 
So in that case, I usually give one to two examples of things I've done. For example, when during patient care or nursing hospital units, you know there's like X amount of things to do. Um, one key skill that I often use is prioritization. Usually when it's an overwhelming amount of work, you can no longer go through your to-do list in a chronological order. So it's important to take a step back and spend five or 10 minutes to kind of think through and identify high priority items based on health-wise, risk-wise, and time sensitivity-wise, what needs to be done fast and first. And so I would like tackle those in that given workday and then push some of the items to the next workday if they're not possible to be done altogether. Instead of trying to achieve everything and then halfway through the list realizing that some high priority items have been missed. I often use another example where I have had to learn to kind of delegate because in those cases on hospital units, a lot of things need to be done for patients. Um, people need to be fed, people need to be given their medication administration to people's hourly vital checks need to be done and so many more assessments have to be completed. And in those cases, if I realize maybe the kind of patient load I have is more than I'm being able to handle, it's important to be able to either delegate to other staff or ask for help from the manager to find somebody else who maybe ended up with a little bit lower load and can take on um, a few of these tasks off of my hand just uh, to give me enough time to catch up to my role because at the end of the day it is a team effort on a unit to get the patient care done and to make sure everybody is cared for. Now on the other hand sometimes I use some more management examples. I've mentioned areas where a lot of conflict was happening between co-workers. They were all bitter towards each other. They were frustrated because they were overworked. So it's important to take a step back and see why people are reacting the way we are. And oftentimes it's because maybe they feel like they've been given an unjust amount of work or there's just too much work for one person to realistically get done. And in those cases, it was important for us to like make a list of like what needs to change or some ideas of what can happen and discuss it with management and say, at this moment, this is the amount of work being done and it's not sufficient to have only two people on the team. There needs to be either a cut down on the workload or there needs to be additional hours added or there needs to be a more staff hired and to have that open and frank conversation with management um, because a lot of the times we don't even realize and subconsciously we express our overworked overwhelming feeling of frustration through like conflict driven attitudes and a lot of the time all we need to do is kind of take a step back and go to the underlying cause and find some variety of alternate solutions which could solve that problem then take it to management and let them choose like which of these strategies they want to use so these kind of conflicts can stop happening so these were some of the answers that i gave um, regarding this question of course these aren't the only ones sometimes i've also been asked like other things like pretty random and not really related to clinical research um, but I've been asked things like okay you're in this given scenario and the patient really doesn't want to do it um, they're not really sure about consenting they did initially consent but now they want to leave the study um, however we need to meet our target patient recruitment number so what do you do so that is kind of a way to kind of test your experience in clinical research but also know that you know the ethics of it so my answer in this case was that and no matter how much I want to hit that number, end of the day, it is the patient's choice. However, I will take one more stab at it by kind of talking to the patient in detail, trying to understand where the concern is coming from, if they're just worried about time constraint for the study, if we can modify that in any way, or if it's just they're not interested in the study, maybe they don't know enough about the study. So a little bit of patient education to kind of tell them these are the benefits of the study that could kind of like help everybody. However, if you still want to drop out of the study, we understand because end of the day, patient care and patient's right to voluntarily drop out of a study is the more important than me meeting my number. Uh, there has to be other strategies which can be utilized to kind of hit those recruitment targets. For example, broadening like your um, platforms from where you're recruiting from maybe instead of one hospital unit you can do it from multiple hospital units or you can like go back to patient charts and see who else was eligible and approach people like that um, the other question which is also like kind of a little vague but basically was um, hey like how do you handle criticism so that's one that I actually got during my interview and I just smiled and said exceptionally well I think I handle criticism very well because for me it's not a personal attack on me it's an opportunity to learn and to improve 
So if somebody's saying I'm doing this thing wrong, I'm gonna wanna have a talk with them and ask what they think. And then if I disagree with their strategy, I wanna have a conversation around it to make sure like we're both seeing it from the same way. And why does this X person or Y person, whether they're senior to me, my equal or my junior in my workplace, um, but we should be able to frankly tell each other, I think if you did it this way, it could go be more efficient. And half the time it's gonna turn out like, yeah, maybe a fresh pair of eyes was needed to figure out what is the more efficient approach. And maybe I will adopt that approach. If I do not adopt it, I will at least, you know, hear them out and at least have a conversation around it and go like, hmm, yeah, maybe we can do it, but I feel like this will make things more messy or more complex because of X, Y, Z reason. So as long as I've had that conversation and accepted that criticism, and then it can be kind of up to me to decide like whether or not I want to accept it as a long-term change in my work style, or if I'm just gonna leave it as like, okay, feedback heard. Um, however, I don't think it's applicable. So both are acceptable strategies. Um, and within the realm of that, I am very open to any kind of criticism, which I don't even take as criticism, I take it as feedback. So this was it. These were some of the most common questions that I received. Um, at the very end, one thing everybody does is they ask us, hey, do you have any questions for us? And I am somebody who will always, always utilize the opportunity to have an open and frank conversation with them. I will ask them, so can you tell me a little bit more about like, how this works, what the work structure is, what kind of the hour expectations are, is it super flexible, is it work from home, is it in person, are there like longer days, is it like weekend, or is it on call, um, how does a typical day look like, that's a question I ask quite a lot, and that's because just like they're judging me and trying to decide if I'm right for the team, I am also trying to test out if them and their work environment is right for me. Um, as a person and kind of fitting in with my lifestyle or kind of fitting in with what I want to be doing. A lot of the times they might say, yeah, you'll be doing invoicing and administration like 40% of the time. Maybe that won't work out for me. Maybe I'm not looking for a role with so much administrative work. I'm looking for a role with more clinical components. I'm looking for a more with more publishing opportunity or more leadership opportunity. So it's really important to have these conversations very frankly and openly from the very beginning. Um, and so ask these questions. When they say, do you have any questions for us? Ask them a very simple thing. Can you just tell me like for this role, what is a typical day gonna look like? But what kind of work am I gonna have to handle? And so in my case, they told me pretty clearly, like you're required on site. There's a lot of patient involvement. There's multiple trials running simultaneously with their own kind of drugs and their own interventions and their own kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria. A lot of the role is about liaising with like federal regulatory bodies and research ethics boards and like doing paperwork and recruiting and screening patients and like making sure everything is running smoothly as well as sample collection and shipments and um, a whole bunch of other things. Um, so just, it's, these are like really important discussions to be had and it's also really exciting. And if it doesn't work out, don't worry about it. You're gonna learn something from every interview and come back stronger. So that was it for this video. I hope it has been helpful. I will definitely do more update videos of interview questions that I have faced. But for now and so far in the last three years of being in this field, these are the common questions that I keep handling. Of course, how you handle each question will vary highly on the kind of work experience you have and also on the level of position that you're applying to. How senior it is, there can be more like management questions. How would you manage and delegate students? How would you manage and delegate other staff? How would you like make somebody super busy, like still listen to you because things need to get done? So I feel like more of these questions come up as you keep moving up in your role in clinical research. I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you did, please show that to me with a like, a subscribe and a comment below of what you thought about it. And if you've ever had to face more difficult or complex questions and I hope I can help you come up with some pretty structured and um, very helpful answers. And that's it for today. This is The Brown Feminist. Bye.